Thanks a lot. I mean, it's been a fantastic day so far, and I'm sure this panel will continue that trend. So let's get started. As you know, the topic today is GIFs Information and the Freedom of Expression. I'm Michelle Ford. I'm the director of the Sydney Southeast Asia Centre, and I'll be chairing the panel today. Uh, we've got two papers, three speakers. The first of which is by Ken Sathiawan from the University of Melbourne, who will talk to us about the state of surveillance, freedom of expression under the Jokowi presidency. Please welcome her. Thanks, Michelle, and thanks, everyone. I'd like to start my presentation with two short examples of how freedom of expression has been increasingly curtailed. In May this year, following the official announcement that Jokowi had been re-elected for a second term, supporters of his rival, Prabowo Subianto, took to the streets. While these protests were unlikely to alter broad public acceptance of the election results, they prompted a very strong response and even a disproportionate disproportionate response from the government by blocking video and image sharing on social media and messaging platforms such as WhatsApp to prevent the spreading of fake news, hoaxes and other content that would be likely to provoke clashes. Very recently, we are seeing a similar approach to protests in Papua where since the 21st of August, internet services have also been blocked. Why does the government do this? What kind of reasons have they given? Um, I'm not going to read out all these um, these three quotes, but the, they are some examples of how um, Indonesian government, government officials have justified these actions. What we see here is that restrictions on civil liberties are couched in broader discourses of national interests, and the suggestion is that what the government is doing is simply the best thing for the people. It is also reminiscent of New Order discourses about the curtailing of human rights. These developments are further evidence of what has been called an illiberal turn in Indonesian politics. It follows a global pattern which has seen a gradual decline of civil and political freedoms across the world for more than a decade, leading some observers, observers to conclude that democracy is in retreat. So my paper is structured in the following way. Um, I consider the illiberal turn through the lens of freedom of expression. Um, I start my paper by briefly discussing some of the achievements and setbacks in this area following the end of the Suharto regime in 1998. I then turn to the Jokowi presidency and the protection of civil and political rights more generally before exploring freedom of expression in four areas being the media, freedom of religion, academic freedom and the right to express personal political opinion. I use these to identify or to illustrate a number of factors that may help us understand democratic backsliding before touching on the implications of this regression for democracy in Indonesia. So first, let's look back. Under the new order, and we know this, freedom of expression was virtually non-existent in Indonesia. The media was tightly controlled and political activists faced risks of arrest and disappearance uh, and even worse. After 1998, many legal reforms were a direct response to the suppression of civil and political rights under the new order. New laws were introduced that were largely modelled on international human rights norms and standards, and these reforms firmly entrenched many human rights, including the freedom of expression in law, including in the Constitution. Those reforms were an impressive and important step forward in undoing many of the restrictions of the authoritarian regime. However, at the same time, new freedoms have also been contested, and that started quite immediate. The 1998 law on freedom of expression, for instance, stipulated that in exercising this freedom, other considerations should be taken into account, such as the balancing of rights and duties, as well as principles of deliberation and consensus. And those limitations have also been very evident in other human rights laws. First signs of regression in the area of freedom of expression became particularly noticeable under the presidency of Megawati Sukarno Putri, with a number of news editors brought to court for defaming politicians and business tycoons. Then under the presidency of Susila Bambang Yudhoyono too, we recorded worrying developments, including increases in violent attacks on journalists by vigilante groups, in many cases orchestrated by state officials. Lawsuits were also increasingly used against journalists and editors under the Yudhoyono presidency. Particularly, the year 2008 was a turning point for freedom of expression with the passing of two laws. One of them, one of them um, the pornography law, it's a better, 
And the other one, the information and uh, the law on information and electronics transactions, the ITE law. And I will talk about that one in particular. Um, the ITE law allows for lawsuits for defamation, the definition of which is very vague. NGOs launched a constitutional court appeal on this clause, but the court rejected this, arguing that uh, defamation is actually, the defamation clause is actually necessary to protect citizens. In addition to these legal instruments, the state also increasingly resorted to other methods to suppress online expression and encourage self-censorship. This included the creation of new websites with the same name of those critical of the government and then filling those new websites with pro-government information. The monitoring and intimidation of government critics was also very well recorded during this time, particularly so in Papua. Thus, in the post-authoritarian era, era, we have seen a liberalization of civil society and the media. Um, we've seen um, an increased uh, protection in law, but many of those freedoms, those newfound freedoms, were also immediately restricted, both in law and practice. So, now we're going to um, go on to Jokowi, Jokowi presidency. The 2014 elections brought renewed attention for human rights issues in the Indonesian political landscape. This was influenced by candidates' backgrounds and contrast made between Jokowi, a civilian, and retired general Prabowo Subianto. The resurgence of Prabowo in the political landscape and Jokowi's electoral promises to address human rights challenges, including a commitment to freedom of information and public communication, led many human rights activists also to support Jokowi, and in turn, Jokowi in 2014 reached out to them. Certainly, some positive developments can be identified early on in Jokowi's first term. These include the lifting of restrictions for foreign journalists to enter and write about Papua, and there was also an announcement made that criminal defamation sentences, particularly in online cases, would be reduced. In the 2015 State of the Nation Address, Jokowi reiterated commitment to resolve human rights issues, particularly mentioning past human rights crimes in Papua. However, human rights issues also very quickly disappeared from the political agenda. A year later, for instance, in 2016, there was no mention of human rights in the State of the Nation Address. And if we just look at practices, yes, um, it became easier for foreign journalists to enter and write about Papua, but the entering of them to the area was also tightly regulated. And many government officials openly said that by entering, by um, allowing foreign journalists to enter, this would actually help to uh, create the image or to um, prove that there were no human rights violations in Papua. And yes, the ITE law was revised and sentences were lowered but the, the definition of defamation was also expanded. The IT law has been used to justify the blocking of websites that were deemed to include offensive content. This could be terrorism-related content, but also LGBTIQ-related content. Um, these developments perhaps reflect a global rise of what has been called digital authoritarianism, or the increasing surveillance of digital spaces. Why has the Jokowi administration not lived up to what we now know was a rather misplaced hope that it would deliver pos positive changes to the protection of civil and political rights, or at least prevent regression in that area? Early analysis have pointed at Jokowi's primary interest in the economic agenda. As a consequence, we could say, well, he's just less interested in non-economic sectors. But it's not just this general disinterest in civil political rights or preference in economic programs or even his alignment with conservative forces, although these all play a role. Um, so Jokowi himself, and this was already addressed um, earlier, appears to have an ambivalent relationship with democracy, illustrated by his comments in 2017 that our democracy has gone too far, or democracy kita kebablasan. He continued that this meant, and I quote, that there are opportunities for the articulation of extreme politics, such as liberalism, radicalism, fundamentalism, sectarianism, terrorism, and other doctrines that are in contradiction with Pancasila, end quote. The solution, according to Jokowi, law enforcement. And one example was um, that July 2017 decree on mass organizations to ban the Hispitarier. However, a real problem from a human rights perspective with this um, 
uh, decree is that it allows the government to unilaterally ban any organization considered to um, contravene the Panchasila, thereby removing judicial oversight on such decisions, which is also a key element in uh, checks and balances uh, on executive power. Now um, over to the four case studies that I mentioned earlier. And I'll go through them fairly quickly. Um, first, developments in the media. I base this graph on data of the NGO SafeNet, which has recorded the number of people charged under the ITE law since its enactment in 2008. And I should note that the data for this year uh, only uh, goes up to August. Uh, so I might have to revise that in my um, new um, uh, uh, draft. Um, what I'd like to point out here is a very noticeable increase between 2015 and 2016. So if we think about, you know, that the IT law has been used in the lead up to elections um, uh, to curb political opposition, yes, but the, the spike between 2015 and 2016 um, draws the attention that this is actually happening after an election. So what explains that? SafeNet data also shows that the IT law is particularly used against activists and journalists, while in most cases, state organizations are the reporting body. And as such, um, I think we can conclude that the IT law has become a tool of the state in order to respond to and suppress criticism. Another aspect of um, freedom of expression where this concerns the media is violence against journalists. Um, this is based on data from the Alliance of Independent Journalists. Uh, again, uh, it's just limited for, for uh, this year. Threats, assaults, and intimidation of journalists have persisted. Um, there's also often overlap between violence against journalists and application of the ITE law. For instance, there was a case of a, a journalist who died in custody um, after he was charged under the ITE law after he had reported on land disputes between local farmers and a big palm oil company. Activists and other journalists have suspected the use of the IT law to silence him. So again here, we see a, we see a noticeable rise between 2015 and 2016, so after Jokowi's election. Now what about freedom of religion? Jokowi, under the Jokowi presidency, we have seen some uh, support um, for religious minorities. For instance, when early on in his first term, the Jokowi government responded to an attack to a Christian church in Aceh by, uh, by Islamic vigilantes by deploying over a thousand police and military personnel to prevent further violence. At the same time, we have seen ongoing vilification of religious minority groups as illustrated by the discrimination of and violence towards Ahmadiyya and Shia communities. Another example has been the 2018 launch of the application Smart Pakam by the Attorney General's office that allowed for the reporting of religious groups that deviate from teachings of officially organized religions. That app included options to report people um, considered to be part of the Ahmadiyya and Shia. Developments like this reflect the influence of Islamic majoritarianism and the furthering of the interests of this group, increasingly dominated by conservative leaders. A worrying trend is also, um, and Eve also touched upon this, those everyday acts of intolerance, rifts in communities between people of different religions, as well as increasing use of derogatory terms in mainstream media, contributing to a normalization of discriminatory and intolerant narratives, for instance, increased use of kafir. A recent piece by Human Rights Watch researcher Andreas Harsono also points at the challenges of Islamism for journalists, and he argues that conservative views of conservative reporting among journalists is becoming an increasing problem in Indonesia. Um, this is because journalists might themselves hold um, uh, conservative opinions or because their employers do so. Uh, which then influences their reporting. And he argues that that kind of reporting supports ongoing discrimination as well as violence against, in some cases, violence against religious minorities. Then I'd like to go to academic freedom. Again, the NGO SafeNet recorded rises in violation of the freedom of association, particularly in the area of academic freedom between 2015 and 2016. Um, what, what kind of issues are we talking about when we talk about academic freedom? Um, they include lawsuits against academics for criticizing rulings of judges, suspension of academics for taking their students to churches to teach about religious tolerance, 
but also, and this is the most conspicuous area, has, has really been a crackdown on academic events related to the 1965 and 1966 mass violence. That, uh, and I think if we then look at that rise of crack, uh, 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 crackdown, particularly in 2015 and 2016, that coincides with the anniversary of that violence, heightened activism both in Indonesia and abroad. There's various factors at play. Um, it can include self-censorship from universities, so from higher up um, uh, uh, that it's determined that those events cannot continue, continue, as well as pressure from hardliner groups and law enforcement bodies, as well as the relationship between these. Um, so, for instance, a quick example, festival in Jakarta on leftist history on the mass violence of 1965. A permit is not given for that event after complaints for hardliner groups, but they do get a permit to demonstrate against the festival organizers. State bodies thus increasingly budge to pressure of illiberal groups and in so doing fail to protect the rights of political minorities. I'll go very quickly through this because of time constraints. Um, we've seen under the Jokowi presidency also increasing use of the blasphemy law to limit the expression of personal views. And of course, Ahok is the most prominent example of that. Um, but it's also been used against ordinary Indonesians, such as this woman, Meliana, um, a Buddhist woman who complained about the volume of the call to prayer at the local mosque, receiving a sentence of 18 months. Um, and those charges against her followed um, uh, sustain, uh, sustained uh, influence or pressure from Islamist groups. The increased use of the blasphemy law is also further evidence of the effects of increased polarization of Indonesian society, which has negative effects on religious and ethnic minorities. Then how can we explain that? My case studies show uh, uh, clear regressions in the area of freedom of expression, and in my paper, I differentiate between, in explaining these, between structural factors, both at the level of state and society, as well as personal factors. I discuss these separately, but I also would like to stress that I, I think that they interact with one another. So if we look at a structural level, I point that the failures or the limitations of political reform after 1998. Liberal reforms were introduced, as I just said, but they were also immediately contested. Those contestations in law and practice occurred well before Jokowi came to power. There are remnants of authoritarian thinking, and perhaps even more worrying, remnants of authoritarian power who continue to hold key political positions. Think of someone like Miranto. Thus, the nature of Indonesia's transition to democracy has always been flawed, and that then prov provides an opportunity for democratic regression. Then structural issues within society um, that contribute to democratic backsliding. Under the Jokowi presidency, we've seen, uh, as was already mentioned, increased polarized society. The blasphemy law trials um, illustrate this, as well as the use of the IT law for political opponents. Um, but that uh, polarization was already evident earlier under uh, uh, during the 2014 presidential campaign. But as, we, as Eve just said, it has intensified. Polarization also explains Jokowi's approach or um, uh, coming closer to conservative Islamic organizations. Another factor is that of the electorate. Indonesians, yes, remain committed to democracy, where, this is, um, where these are free, free and fair elections, but the electorate is also increasingly conservative and is very ambivalent towards um, individual rights. If we look at results from, for instance, a, uh, Asian barometer, barometer surveys points to this. So the right to protest, for instance, is far less um, support it. Then also a quick comment about the human rights movement. And you can see I put quotation marks there. We need to consider this because this civil society, the civil society or these liberal groups can be seen as a force against some of these developments. However, the human rights movement has always been fragmented. Again, that's not just something that happened under Jokowi that has its roots far um, 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 uh, further back in Indonesian history. It also has very limited social and political influence. It is divided, an example being the regulation on mass organizations, which was in fact supported by many human rights activists who see Hatei, Hizbut Tahrir, as a very clear threat to their agendas. And then political leaders, so personal, I, knew, I call these personal factors, um, uh, and they relate to Jokowi himself. Much can be explained, I believe, by his political weakness, particularly in 2014. But again, that weakness we've seen in 2019 persists, which translates into insecurity. This has led to alliances with conservative forces, uh, means that he's surrounded by liberals, so he we see an overlap with um, you know, the structural uh, state factors. Um, and that insecurity fe feeds, I believe, the need for Jokowi to appear firm and decisive. 
That insecurity may also be at the basis of the notable rise of the use of the IT law pressure towards journalists and academic freedom at the start of his tenure. And then personal preferences already spoke about that focus on economic and developmental goals. That is what really matters to him, or so it appears. Um, and um, his low commitment to the democratic principles is also illustrated by that, uh, by that argument that democracy has gone too far. The use of highly nationalist discourses, such as an emphasis on Pancasila, the unitary state of Indonesia, all overriding objectives that further economic and developmental goals um, and justify also limitations on civil and political rights. And I'll go very quickly um, through the last slide. Sorry, Michelle. Uh, to wrap up, yes, increased surveillance under Jokowi of individuals, but not just by state bodies, uh, but also societal actors, sometimes facilitated by the state, and also big businesses think of the application of IT law of journalists. Um, those developments, I argue in my paper, illustrate the limits of liberal democracy and the limits of acceptance of minorities, whether these are religious minorities, political minorities. Why is this? I identified those three factors. Um, and I, um, uh, and uh, as I argue, the result is that while electoral democracy might not be directly in danger, what is at stake is the quality of democracy and the place of individual rights within this. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thanks so much. Uh, our second paper is going to be delivered by two researchers from Pusat Paramadina, Yashad Rafshadi and Dia Ayu Kartika, and they're going to talk to us about political rumors in Indonesian elections, evidence from Kalimantan. <coughs> okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Eve and Tom for having us here. Um, it is a big honor for us to speak at this big conference, and this is my first time in Athens too. So uh, today, uh, we would like to present our recent research on rumors, mobilization, and electoral violence in Indonesia, evidence from West Kalimantan. This is actually a part of bigger project that Pusat Paramedina conducted on rumors and violence. So just a little bit background, uh, th that rumors have long been used in politics. However, online technology takes rumors to another level. It helps a rapid and far-reaching transmission of information as well as disinformation. Hoaxes, as many Indonesians refer to, often exploit the identity cleavages in society, causing anxiety and fear, even sometimes lead to violence. So far, the way government reacted to this issue has, been not, has not been satisfying. Um, the ITE law seems to bring more controversy rather than a concrete solution, as Ken mentioned earlier. The content blocking, um, the criminalization of political opponents for online defamation cases, and the internet shutdown during Jakarta and Papua riots, uh, just an examples how the government potentially undermine Indonesian democracy. In this study, we observed uh, 2018 uh, West Kalimantan gubernatorial election, <clears throat> which observers refer as the most contentious and the most vulnerable to violence. There are two underlying factors. The first one is the long history of ethnic conflict, uh, which often targets minority groups, such as Madaris, Chinese, and in this case, Javanese. Second is the adaptation of religious sentiment as seen in 2017 Jakarta election. The IPEC report uh, after the election showed that the election was relatively peaceful, with minor violence in Landak Regency, thanks to the anti-hoax community that was actively debunking and countering hoaxes uh, at the time. On another note, we, we can also see that um, the magnitude of online-based rumors to spur violence in electoral settings. So based on uh, that background, we specifically looked at the Landak uh, district uh, where violence occurred to understand how rumors were interplayed and caused violence. We aim to answer these two questions, uh, when are political rumor used, and when does it lead to violent mobilization? Also, how do communities collectively interpret political rumors and verify such information? As we look deeper uh, into the village level, uh, we have two general findings. The first one is that rumors were, uh, were circulated widely before and after the election, but the violence occurred only in certain villages and only after the voting day. Uh, and the second uh, point is in these violent cases, 
the local residents interpreted the situation through the lens of prior problems and worsened the pre-existing ethnic and religious cleavages. Consequently, they have a very limited possibility to clarify the rumors. So what about the West Kalimantan election? This election is actually very critical uh, for the re-establishment of power between the two major ethnic groups, Dayaks and Malays. Dayaks have taken the um, leadership for 10 consecutive years under the Cornelius administration. Thus, this election was a golden opportunity for the Malays to take power. There were three candidates, uh, three candidate pairs running for this election. The first one is Milton uh, Boyman, uh, Boyman, sorry, who have a mixed background. Uh, uh, the Dayak Malays, Christian Muslims, and they claim to be a nationalist candidate to attract more vote. But in fact, they got the least votes uh, in the election. Many believe their participation was only aimed to diffuse the votes of two other stronger pairs. The pair number two, number two is uh, Caroline and Gidot, the representative of Dayaks. Uh, Caroline is Cornelis' daughter, uh, the central figure in Dayak community. Cornelis was the mastermind behind uh, uh, Caroline's candidacy, which explained many rumors were targeted to Cornelis, not to Caroline. Aside from her father's support, uh, Caroline also got access to the Japanese community through uh, her husband, a Japanese blue blood, uh, and this Japanese community, particularly in Landak, uh, even granted her a title, a respected title, and declared support for Caroline. The third pair, uh, Sutarmiji and Norsan, both are Ma Muslim Malays, uh, and the winner of the election. They were supposed, supported by the su su uh, Sultanate, uh, the Islamic Defender Front, and other Islamic organizations. They mainly employed religious issue uh, in the campaign to get the votes from the Malays, Madaris, and Japanese. The pair won the election by 51.5%, higher than Caroline's and Milton Ford's uh, combined. So on the right side, uh, you can see the, a map of distribution of religious population indicated by color green for Muslim population and the color red for the more non-Muslim population, vis-a-vis -vis the vote share that Sutarmiji and uh, Caroline got. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the Sutarmiji uh, indicated by a, sh a shade and dots for Caroline and Gidot. From the map, we can conclude two things, that the use of religious uh, sentiment uh, was again effective uh, for the, uh, in the West Kalimantan election. You can see the greenish areas mostly fought for uh, Sutarmiji, whereas uh, Caroline won in non-Muslim majority areas. And you also maybe notice the bright red um, area. It is Landak, um, which is a Cornelis and Caroline's stronghold, and in, in which uh, violence occurred uh, after the voting day. So, I'm so sorry you have to see this explicit image. <laughs> but yeah, I, I will explain to you why this is necessary. <laughs> so yeah, how, how the rumors uh, used in this election. So according to the local police record, there were um, eight uh, of ITE low cases throughout the election conducted by both Sutarmijis and Caroline supporters. So both camps were doing the same strategy to denounce uh, candidates. And I pick only three uh, images or three rumors here. The first one here, there, uh, that one, uh, actually uh, a video of Cornelis uh, saying that the Malays and the Muslim are con colonizers of Dayak. And this video circulated before the voting day and provoked public protest, mainly from the Muslims. The video was even used as a spinning strategy to Ahok Karnolist. Uh, as you can see in the picture, there were banners everywhere. Uh, in this one, yeah, this one. Oh, yeah. Uh, that urged authorities to arrest Cornelis. And for the second image, um, was again targeted Cornelis. This is actually part of a meme uh, circulated around after uh, the quick count result published. And it's to depict that Cornelis was exhausted after uh, the defeat of uh, his daughter. It aimed to mock Cornelis uh, by showing the explicit pose of him. Nevertheless, it was successfully offended many Dayaks and became one of the many reasons behind the violent mobilization. And this third uh, image uh, of a clip uh, of Dayak motorcyclist yelling death threats at the Japanese community in Sambora village. The footage was circulated on WhatsApp groups, as you might notice also, it's a part of the WhatsApp uh, screenshot, and causing many Japanese uh, fearful of their life. 
So how the rumor played in the violent mobilization? Uh, it started after the polling stations announced the vote counts. Overall, Caroline won in Landak with high percentage, uh, around 87%, although not as much as expected by the Caroline supporters. In some Japanese Muslim majority villages such as uh, Sambora and Karangan, Sutarmiji got significant, significantly higher votes, uh, higher votes than Caroline. It caused uh, disappointment among Caroline supporters because of the agreement of the Japanese to support uh, Caroline. At the same time, the meme that mocked Caroline that you see, er uh, Cornelis that you see earlier circulated, as well as rumors that the Japanese were celebrating Sutarmiji's victory. This background triggered uh, Dayak's anger, and they began to spread that threat and intimidation in Sambora, Karangan, and neighboring villages. Two days after, a riot took place in Ngabang, the heart of Landak. Uh, you can see a picture right there. Uh, there's like a burning tires on the street, uh, and also they wrecked Japanese uh, foot stalls near the, near the terminal, near the bus station. Uh, about the same time, another riot took place in Karangan village. The photos and videos shared on Facebook and WhatsApp groups, and it makes the conflict uh, mounted to greater stake. Many residents uh, of Karangan and Sambora started to flee. Approximately 226 people seek for protection at the military camp, as you can see in this picture. Eh? Sorry, in this picture. So fortunately, the police made a quick response to control the situation. On Saturday 30 June, the police asked the key figures, Cornelis and Caroline, not only release um, a, pub a public statement, rather directly talk to their supporters in Landak. It successfully decreased the tension and the fleeing uh, residents began to come home. Okay, next slides onwards will be explained by my colleague Irshad. Thanks, Kathy. Those series of incidents that uh, Kathy explained have raised a question as to why violent intimidation only occurred in specific villages. Most people and local authorities that we made say that violence was due to the online rumors and the Dayak's frustration over Caroline's loss. We're not so sure because in some places where Caroline lost, nothing was happened uh, or the tension uh, didn't escalate. So we should look at where the villages are on the map and what was happened there. This is uh, the village, the map of the all villages in Landak and Mumpawa Regency, both of which are administrative fragmentation of uh, then Pontianak Regency. And for each village, we geocoded several things. First, uh, as the previous map, we code the Muslim and non-Muslim population as the main cleavage, both indicated by color gradation from green to uh, red. And second, candidate of 2018 election who won most votes at village level, indicated by the line and dot. And third, similar villages with different results, that is the, the one that experienced violence and another one that withstand violence in the aftermath of the election, both indicated by the black and white label. And lastly, we also marked the border of the villages that experienced ethnic violence in the late 90s. So as you can see, Landak is Christian Dayak majority area and won by Caroline, but within it, there are opposing Muslim Malays villages won by Sutarmiji. And in Mampawa, it, Mampawa is Muslim Malay majority area, but there are two sub-districts bordering with Landak that are Dayak majority. And within it, there are opposing Muslim Japanese villages who fought for Sutarmiji. So the map so several things about the villages that were affected by rumors and the one that survived rumors and violence. Villages that most affected by rumors are ethnic religious mixed villages and have long standing problems with violent conflict. They are located either on the border area or near the main road or at the center of the sub district. And those areas generally have good internet coverage. In those villages, Dayak people quickly mobilize and Malay or Japanese people easily got afraid by the rumors and fled their homes. Villages that generally can withstand rumors and violence are relatively homogeneous communities, especially those who can defend themselves or have backing from their patron. For example, they have connection with Pontianak Sultanate and FBI. And second, um, 
mixed village, but with close inter-ethnic relation, also survive uh, rumors and violence. In those villages, the Dayaks even protected the Malays and Japanese people from outside threats. So the explanation for, for, of this uh, variation seems uh, to be very local. The legacy of the past ethnic conflict and the misuse of identity politics makes those villages uh, vulnerable to political violence. Some areas affected by rumors are the hotspot of mass violence in the late 90s. And the conflict is often recurring. In Karangan village, a year before the election, rumors following the murder of a Dayak woman spark riots and forced Malay residents to flee their homes. The hardening of exploitation of identity cleavages can be seen from the establishment or activation of several new primordial organizations in 2017, or a year before the election. There were Perkumpulan Orang Melayu, or Malay groups, Forum Pemuda Dayak, or uh, the Dayak Forum, and Paguyu Banjawa, the Japanese Brotherhood, and so on. They spark the pride of their group, but at the same time, uh, they also cast the feeling of being threatened. Several ethnic associations actually tried to dispel the rumors, but they rarely reached to the grassroots. It makes verification mechanism at the community level seem to be far more significant. Karangan village was the most affected by rumors because no communication whatsoever between the different community leaders, and the Muslim Malay villagers just left to save their life. Furthermore, the intervention of local leaders and authorities are necessary to mitigate the adverse effect of rumors. Following tensions, local leaders and villagers in several places perform pamabang. Pamabang is a dayak ritual to resolve the conflict and prevent the recurrence of violence with a very severe uh, customary sanction. So this one in the picture was performed near Sambora village uh, and the tension there quickly decreased. We didn't see pamabang or any effort to reduce the tension and restore the ethnic relation in Karangan. But despite its local explanation, what happened in West Kalimantan cannot be uh, separated from the national contact. In last year's Indonesia update and in our discussion today, it showed how widespread religious and racial sentiments among Indonesian Muslims and how intolerance was mobilized during and after the anti ahok campaign in 2017. The strategy has uh, long been used by politicians to generate fear and to mobilize voters. And online technology amplifies its effect. But the stakes are not just about the election. It is also about the competition of a daily domination. In some places, Caroline won at the village or sub-district level, but the Japanese or Malay minority groups were still attacked. Dayak groups are worried that they will end up like a hawk. On the other hand, Muslim Malay groups felt discriminated against during Cornelis leadership and they were very eager to bring Muslim victory in Jakarta to West Kalimantan. The call to vote for Muslim candidate in the, uh, on the left poster and the demand to arrest Cornelis on the right poster is very much uh, reminds us of the Jakarta election. So what's the big deal? Uh, okay, <laughs> there are rumors and a little upheaval after the election, but in the end, everything's uh, under control and nobody got killed. Uh, so why if even is this problem? Uh, actually, uh, this is one of uh, our reasons to raise this case because the problem is we see a rising tendency of the government, especially, to think that uh, rumor is spreading massively and the whole nation is mobilized almost automatically. The measures taken become excessive, misses the main problems and undermines the freedom of expression instead. Before the polling day, the West Kalimantan Regional Police has criminalized several suspects of online defamation. And yet, manipulation and intimidation still occurred. Technological and penal intervention may help in extreme situations, but will not necessarily solve the problem. They should not distract us from the more significant issues of Indonesian democracy, civil liberty, pluralism, and political equality, regardless of religion and ethnicity. The priority must be on strengthening local democratic institution and resistance to rumors and violent incitement. Thank you.
Okay, thanks so much. Um, just before we start the questions, I'd like to remind you of a few of the things Sally drew our attention to. Please, no speeches, no multi barrel questions, just one question each. We're a little short of time, so I'd really appreciate it if you could respect that. I'll take three questions to start with. One down the front, two. Yep, so one in the front, then two. Do we have one on this side? Okay, we'll start with two then. Thank you for um, your insightful presentation. I have a question specifically for Kathy and uh, Irshad. Um, regarding the how the internet has been used to spread rumors which um, incited violence, uh, we remember uh, during the May uh, riot in Jakarta, the government resorted to slow down the internet to uh, control the spread of rumors, so they argue. And even critics um, were saying that it was justifiable. Uh, but then the government did it again with uh, Papua, and this time it's a um, total blackout. Uh, and I think it's been. And your question is? Um, and my question so, uh, what do you think, to what extent that um, this sort of measure is justifiable? Uh, okay, thank you. And we had the second question there. Uh, thank you uh, for your interesting presentations. Uh, my name is Radin. Um, I'd like to ask. Uh, the panel what their opinion is of the quality of journalism in Indonesia generally, um, especially the last several years, and does the lack of what's perceived as independent, high quality type of journalism, which analyzes events and information in the er political arena, contributes as a factor towards the sort of uh, use of uh, rumors as a sort of manipulative tool in events? Okay, thank you very much. Like Thanks for the question. Actually, uh, after the my incident, we asked several activists, uh, uh, we asked their opinion about the government policy to shut down the internet. And interestingly, most of them are, are agree the government shut down the internet. Uh, the internet shutdown in Papua is different, uh, uh, of course. But yeah, most of them are agree. And uh, for us, it is not justifiable and, and not effective because people will uh, find a way to to communicate. To communicate. And what is uh, worrying is that uh, more internet shutdown and restrictions are followed by the restriction on our or the. Uh, violation of human rights. Uh, and yeah, that's what I'm worrying in Papua now. So that I think it's not effective and not, not justifiable. Okay, I will add. Hello. Yeah. I just want to add something maybe uh, to what extent maybe we can also see the the context of uh, each conflict like in Papua riots it is like totally different context with the Jakarta riots we might notice that in Jakarta riots maybe they have a mobilization and also hoaxes spread around not only from Jakarta to outside uh, Jakarta but also from outside Jakarta to Jakarta uh, but in Papua we also know and uh, that uh, there's like a long uh, problem there and there's a long conflict there and uh, it's like something that uh, the government made uh, it's like a just a justification from the government for uh, for doing this uh, intervention so just uh, an additional uh, comment from what uh, Kair should say that it's not really an effective uh, way to solve this problem I think Maybe just to quickly add on that first point, to what extent are restric restrictions justified? Um, civil liberties can be restricted for concerns of national security. That happens. But the point being is, is that um, they must be proportionate um, and there must be judicial oversight. There must be rules around that. And that's what I believe is currently lacking. Um, and of course, you know, uh, the context of the Jakarta riots in Papua is different, but we do see here a similar pattern of, of blocking of information. And the issue there is, is that, and I think this ties also to that question of, you know, um, uh, the necessity to have independent and high quality journalism, it touches upon having an informed citizenry. And that is important when we are going to talk about democratic quality. 
and um, uh, you know um, uh, also and this is um, when I say you know maybe no direct threat to electoral democracy but we need to think about what the long-term implications are of um, censorship of blocking of information you know maybe not directly but if that means that people are ill-informed about what's going on and how it affects minorities then I do think that we have a, a problem hey more questions don't let me put you off the questions. <laughs> One at the back there and another here. Was that a third? So, quick question for Kathy and Irshad. Uh, could you tell us what happened in 2019 election? Because we know that Sutarumiji ended up supporting Jokowi. So is this kind of polarization still going on or just gone? Uh, Jeff Mulheron, uh, presumably these access to the internet all these things are viable in all countries all over the world. What's different about Indonesia? Is this a problem you can solve from looking internally in Indonesia or is this a, a, a broader issue? It's a broader issue. Okay. 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 I couldn't see a third. Do we have a third question? Okay, we'll just take the two for now, thanks. Oh, hang on. Um, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, it's an interesting question. Oh, it's an interesting question because the uh, 2018 uh, West Kalimantan election is uh, prepared for the uh, national uh, election in 2019. And it, do, it didn't translate uh, to the national uh, because uh, Sutaramiji, who was supported by the Islamist API, uh, uh, turned out he support uh, Jokowi and it quite pissed off the Islamists because they, yeah, they dis disappointed because uh, Sutaramiji fought for Jokowi and they now uh, use the old sultanate, which is uh, has long been uh, yeah, not uh, not active, so they they use the, the Sultanate Pontianak Sultanate to to force their agenda. So uh, yeah, uh, and maybe this uh, also uh, relates to what, uh, for example, what uh, Mar Marcus Mitzner found in Maluku that uh, it's quite uh, different uh, uh, dynamics uh, between uh, province and national level. Kitty, okay, good. Maybe I just add some uh, another event that actually happened. A violence uh, happened after the 2019 election. So after uh, in Jakarta we have the riots, and also there's a riot conducted in the West Kalimantan in Pontianak City. So I don't think that uh, maybe polarization is not there uh, anymore because of Sutarmiji turning uh, their hats to Jokowi. But it's more on this uh, Islamist organization still mobilizing people there, uh, although. Uh, despite uh, Sutarmiji's being uh, supporting Jokowi. And there's violence in Kalimantan in 2019. Yeah, and, and there's violence in 2018 and 2019. On May. On May. Yeah, on May. Yeah. Um, so on the question of what's so special or what's special about Indonesia, as I mentioned in my paper, um, that the use of or the abuse of um, uh, or the blocking of internet or uh, online services and all of that has happened elsewhere. So in that sense, that is part of what I refer to as that rise in digital authoritarianism, or that's what the literature around it says. Um, I think, you know, more broadly, it um, forces us to critically look at the role of the internet and social media in democratic practice. Uh, it's often been said, you know, it can be very liberating. It offers uh, opportunities for an alternative voice. And that's indeed what social media and the internet can do. However, there's of course also al always another side to that. Um, and um, yes, that might not be um, unique to Indonesia, um, but um, you know, I must say, you know, my paper doesn't go into that. But um, for me, it, um, it uh, forces, I think, to think, rethink about the role of um, these new technologies um, in um, uh, democracies and the furthering of illiberal aims. Okay, any last burning questions? Okay, in the front here, we'll take one more if we've got it. Yeah, in the mid back there. Okay, thanks. 
Yeah, thank you for um, uh, for this last presentation. Actually, um, I did some research there in West Kalimantan as well. <coughs> yeah, sorry. <coughs> yeah, um, Cornelis actually was the first Dayak uh, governor after, was it since 1965? So there, he was there for eight years. Um, actually, because I did some research in Putisibao, which is very, very close to some uh, to that area where you were doing research. And your question How, is? Yeah. Um, well, my question is, we get to the point. <laughs> um, how, um, let's say, the coverage of internet uh, eight years, actually, when I was doing research, uh, coverage was very, very limited. Internet coverage is now how, how good? Oh. Okay, thanks. And the question at the back. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to address my question to Irshad and Kathy from Paramadina. Uh, I think your point about the local verification on the rumors in uh, uh, local election is very interesting because uh, your your research remind us to the the old conflict in Kalimantan where you know the situation was so chaotic. So my question is, how does it how does exactly work the local uh, verification? Like who should verify it and who should be included in the process of verification itself. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, about the about the internet coverage, uh, you can check uh, the app named uh, Open Signal, and you can see the map that uh, of Indonesian uh, signal coverage of internet, and we showed it in the in the in the map that. Most of the coverage is on the center of the sub-district, for example, and near the main road. So the inland area are not yet covered by internet. But uh, yeah, information still got there uh, in other ways, yeah, yeah. but not as, as uh, fancy as in the uh, center area. And so verification, yeah. Uh, usually in the village, uh, especially mixed village, they are the community leaders of each ethnicity. For, for Malay, for example, they are uh, MABM, or Majelis Adat and Budaya Melayu in there. And they are also the leader of the Japanese. Actually, usually the leaders of uh, the respective communities that do the uh, communication and verification, and they uh, speak to the, their uh, respective community. And the role of the village headers, the sub-district headers, the uh, local policy are also uh, significant in in that mechanism. Uh, what we see in Karangan, why why does the uh, ethnic leaders and the police didn't speak to each other? Because the Malay uh, villagers, uh, which is minority in Karangan, uh, believe that the uh, actor of the riots and the violence is the relatives of the. Uh, village headers and they didn't uh, have any respect to the, to the village leader and they just left and the verification didn't happen. So uh, I think that's the illustration of this. Okay. Uh, okay. Thanks so much for those papers and I'd like us all to join in before we move straight into the next session. And so without uh, further ado, uh, uh, I look forward to uh, hearing from uh, this next panel uh, on the uh, populist um, uh, the populist moment uh, in Indonesia. So uh, we'll first have uh, Liam Gaman, a PhD candidate um, in the Department of Political and Social Change at uh, ANU. Oh, okay, good evening. Um, it's an honor to be on this panel with Mugis and to together be the one thing standing between you and happy hour. So I'll try and keep this entertaining. Um, I'm very, I'm grateful that, that Alan Hicken earlier today sort of validated the importance of talking about populism here because uh, by, by, by highlighting essentially that in this day and age, populism really is uh, one of the most prominent threats to the quality of democracy worldwide. And certainly among scholars of Indonesian democracy, there always has been this worry about the, the sort of the latent threat of populism in the Indonesian system. And this was really well illustrated um, uh, by that 2014 election uh, when you essentially had what, what many saw as two populists competing against each other. The good populist uh, in Jokowi and the bad populist in Prabowo. Anyway, we're, we're meant to understand that the good populist won. Um, having said that, uh, 
so I'm, I'm now got to sort of focus on Jokowi in this presentation. I've been asked to talk about, well, populism, what it is, how it works in Indonesia, and what its effects are on the quality of democracy, specifically with reference to Jokowi. And my argument is a little bit boring because I actually don't think that populism really has a lot to do with the present uh, democratic regression in Indonesia. Uh, and I'll nail my colors to the mast. I agree, I, I think the quality of democracy is declining, but as I hope to be able to explain, um, it, it's, Indonesia is not taking a, a, a populist path towards a lower quality of democracy necessarily. Um, Jokowi is in fact actually, well, I'll, I'll explain later. Anyway, okay, <laughs> where's my clicker? Populism, what is it? Okay, um, it's sort of traditional by now to joke that um, if there's one thing that academics can agree upon when it comes to populism, it's that nobody can agree what populism is. Um, and that's a bit over the top, but it, it's, it's fair to say that still it's a contested concept. We, we, we are literally, we are in the 50th anniversary this year of the first edited volume that tried to figure out what populism is. And there are still major disagreements about how to best define it, how best to identify it when you see it, how best to you know, operationalize it for comparative political science. But you know, I wouldn't overstate uh, the extent to which it's a problem for you know, making comparisons between different countries. Um, Sorry, uh, but I will say, uh, to generalize, there are generally two main streams of, of thought about what populism is. Firstly, that it's, a, that it's an ideological construct, um, that it's usually associated with a particular type of quote unquote populist rhetoric. Um, that it's, you'll, uh, some scholars argue that it's a, what you call a thin ideology that attaches itself to other sort of political philosophies. Thus, you can have you know, left-wing populism, you can have right-wing populism, nationalist populism, neoliberal populism, you name it. Um, another mainstream in the literature um, and is sort of sees populism in, in material terms, that it's, it's, it's an identifiable, you know, solid, concrete um, form of political linkage. It's a form of political mobilization um, and organization um, that is distinct from, from other types. And I'll put myself in the second category. Um, so I think, just so you know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about populism, that populism is, and I quote, a political strategy through which a personalistic leader seeks or exercises government power based on direct, unmediated, uninstitutionalized support from large numbers of mostly unorganized followers. Got another quote here from Nikos Mazelis. Um, and well, you can read that for yourself, but I would say that that is, I mean, this kind of gets to what makes populism um, so interesting and, and so potentially uh, disruptive in patronage democracies like Indonesia. What makes it distinctive is that it's all about uh, forming unmediated links between the leader, the, pers the personalistic leader and uh, a mass uh, following um, that is preoccupied with cutting out a role for the sorts of um, the brokerage and the intermediation, which we know from all this literature on clientelism in Indonesia is so much a part of elite uh, mass relations. So having uh, defined populism to everybody's satisfaction, um, why, why, why precisely is it considered a hazard to democracy? Um, well, we have this populist template for authoritarian, or authoritarian backsliding or, or democratic collapse. Um, and it goes somewhat like this. A populist leader who is typically, not always, I mean, it's important not to conflate the categories of outsider and populist, we're always told, but in, a, in practice, populists are almost always outsiders. So they gain office, uh, often in, a context of a, in the context of a um, economic or political crisis, with a mandate to sweep away the establishment. And so, um, you know, being emboldened by crisis situations means that they often do seek to erode uh, forms of horizontal accountability and marginalize their opponents all in the name of the people, the rakyat, el pueblo, or whatever. Um, so, I mean, I've got some pictures up here of the, you know, your classic, you know, populist authoritarian figures. Um, I mean, I mean, Taksin's an interesting case because, I mean, I suppose with the backlash against Taksin that really, um, um, sort of ended Thai democracy, the 1987 after Thai democracy, whatever. So anyway, but the, the question is, uh, how representative are these kind of really vivid cases of populism as a whole? And well, uh, thankfully, despite the quibbles about the definition of populism, 
there's enough agreement among scholars about which politicians and political movements are populist that you can sort of create these databases of populist or non-populist politicians and then compare how the populists um, perform in terms of democratic quality to non-populists. And the results are pretty much all the same, whether you take you know, a selection from Latin America or globally, um, there is strong evidence for that there's a probabilistic relationship between populism and democratic regression. They're more likely to amend constitutions. They're more likely, more likely to uh, attack press freedoms. They're more likely to um, yeah, try and delegitimize political opponents in all sorts of ways. So the link between populism and democratic regression is real, but it's not automatic. I mean, not every populist obviously turns into a Fujimori or a Duterte. Um, so the question is, okay, on, on, under, on, sorry, in which circumstances do populist leaders actually start to erode checks and balances and start to erode checks on their power? And you look at evidence from Latin America, and one thing that all of the, you know, the bad populists, the really bad cases have in common, uh, is that they, um, they rise, rise to power in the context of a power vacuum at the elite. They face hostile legislatures and other sorts of you know, horizontal, uh, horizontal checks that are controlled by their opponents. Um, and the presidents um, are very popular. Um, so uh, in, in effect, this is just a long-winded way of saying that uh, when the pre-existing, when the pre sorry, when the pre-existing sort of sites of elite power are, are strong relative to the outsider populist, um, you don't really see that you don't really see that uh, uh, those attacks on, on on institutions. In other words, um, populist leaders go populist once in government when they have the incentive and the capability to do so, when they're emboldened by the, the circumstances. Now, um, as, as Alan pointed out, and as um, uh, a few other people have alluded to, um, really what we're talking about here frequently is political parties. Uh, now, as I talk, hope to talk about in a moment, in important ways, the weaknesses of politi Indonesian political parties um, explain a lot of why, uh, explain why Indonesia is seen as a, as a, a fertile ground for populism. At the same time, in important ways, Indonesian political parties are very, very strong at the apex of the political system, enough to present, prevent, so far, this uh, sort of scenario. So anyway, my argument is populism is not really a cause of Indonesia's present democratic regression. And, and let's be specific about, about what we're talking about here. Uh, the, the populist threat to Indonesian democracy is a populist president. Um, so Indonesian, Indonesia's political system does have some features which in combination do create a hospitable environment for the emergence of populist politics. But the specific combination of circumstances, which has been behind populist-led democratic regression or collapse in Latin America, for instance, and elsewhere, I'm thinking the Philippines, doesn't exist yet in Indonesia. Um, and even if they did, oh wait, and even if those crisis circumstances did exist, um, there are certain features of the way that the Indonesian political system works uh, that make the sorts of pathways to the presidency that have been taken by the likes of Fujimori or Duterte or other authoritarian populists uh, unviable in the Indonesian context. Um, okay, so what are the things, some of the things, why would we expect you know, Indonesia to have a problem with populism? Well, I mean, it's a presidential system and the relationship between presidential systems and populism is kind of self-evident, didn't even put on the board. But even certain features of the Indonesian system uh, have been associated with the rise of political outsiders and populists. Um, Weak parties and a fragmented party system. Uh, parties, yes, very weak in some respects. In other important respects, very strong. Um, we heard all about that uh, this morning in the political update presentation. Um, well, I mean, Paul has written a whole book uh, on how um, decentralization sort of fractures the vertical coherence of, of, of patronage networks um, and you know, alienates voters from political parties. You get these very personalized um, patronage uh, networks at the grassroots, again, very, very clear that that's absolutely the case in Indonesia. Um, low levels of trust in key democratic institutions is always something that's associated with, popular, uh, with uh, the rise of populism. Um, people have tested that and it, and it stacks up. Whether there are low levels of trust in key institutions, I, just, I would put that down as debatable. We'll have to wait for Borhan's presentation tomorrow. But I would say that there's, there's low enough trust that, that being an outsider has cachet. Um, so again, 
these, for all these reasons, it shouldn't have been a, a huge surprise that Jokowi rose um, to national prominence uh, as a populist. Uh, and by, by populist, I mean he, he, he does actually, um, there are some really, really uncanny similarities between his rise in Indonesia and that of, say, Fernando Collor in Brazil in the, in the 80s, or Jair Bolsonaro, or Duterte, you know, Duterte. Don't want to, you know, overstretch the, the comparison there, but um, he was one of this, of course, this class of quote unquote reformist local leaders, um, often referred to as local populists, you know, you know, without ever trying to, you know, really delve into the populism literature there. Um, but what really, what really uh, elevated him a, a, among that class of, you know, very popular local leaders that he, that he came up with after 2004, 2005 was the fact that he was very ambitious for national office after he was re-elected in 2010. Um, and then he was very, very smart about using the national news media to make himself a national political figure. Um, if you remember that, that SM car, which is basically, you know, bits and pieces of four wheel drives bolted together by some school students, um, it weighed like three tons and made about 110 horsepower. Um, but it was a publicity stunt. I mean, he phoned up political consultants and pollsters in Jakarta and said, is this going to get me on TV? And it absolutely did. Um, this was, I think, an important part in demonstrating to the party patrons in Jakarta that he was a viable candidate, you know. Um, he runs for governor of Jakarta as well, uses the Jakarta governorship in a very similar fashion. Um, very, very strategic use of public office to uh, get free media on television. And uh, by the time, for instance, that he was being inaugurated as governor of Jakarta in 2012, he was already the most popular politician in the country. Uh, and he was already showing up in regional polls in places of Indonesia where he had never been and he had no political infrastructure. Um, he was already showing up in polls as the most popular presidential candidate for 2014. Now, structuralist scholars have, you know, subsequently gone back into this history and said, well, you know, it was all the patronage of Megawati and Prabowo that did this. And yes, that's part of it, of course. But uh, on the flip side of that, what I would say is what's so remarkable about Jokowi's rise is that it cost so little money and involved so little actual building of political infrastructure around the country. And you could say that, you know, he was following in the footsteps of SBE in 2004. It's a very fair point, probably accurate. But what makes Jokowi so, so, so interesting and so illustrative of the potential for populism in Indonesia, notwithstanding the stuff I'm going to talk about in a moment, uh, is that he really did it from the very margins of national politics uh, relative to SBA. Populist policy, quote unquote. I don't think there's anything such thing as populist policy. Like I said, uh, you know, populist policy is only populist to the extent that it's about, you know, making concrete and tangible that linkage between the elite, between the, the leader and their followers. Um, so uh, you talk to... Um, and so this is where Jokowi's social policy and healthcare policies become interesting. Um, you talk to people who work for Jokowi and Solo and Jakarta, uh, and they said, you know, I get quotes like this, you know, we saw these, these healthcare cards as like membership cards for his base. And what is really quite, quite interesting about the, the healthcare programs that he pioneered in Solo and in Jakarta and then now at the national level is um, that focus on cutting out a role for much, much of the bureaucracy. Um, he was always concerned with making these programs universal uh, and he doesn't want those grassroots bureaucrats um, or political parties to build up clientele of their own. He wants them to, he wants the voters to be very, very clear about who this is coming from. Um, uh, I probably don't have time to talk about this, but yeah, yeah, there are some interesting avenues about how he manipulated the SOE sector in Jakarta and um, basically centralized control of, of, of patronage um, in, say, the um, government contracting and so on. Um, but anyway, suffice it to say, look, yes, he rose to, he rose to prominence as a populist in a very similar fashion to a lot of populists around the world. But, okay, so it's 2013, 2014, and uh, he wants to run for president. He's the most popular um, politician in Indonesia. If this were the Philippines or Latin America, he might have the opportunity to found one of these personal vehicle parties out of, out of nothing, basically. Um, you, again, when Rodrigo Duterte was nominated for president, he, the PD, PDP Laban had precisely zero congressional seats, um, one senator. Um, Jair Bolsonaro as well, tiny parties. Rafael Correa, Fujimori, these guys found parties out of basically nothing. 
Now, everyone who knows Indonesian politics is going to guess at what I'm going to say next. You can't do this in Indonesia. Uh, the party registration rules make it basically, uh, well, pre very prohibitive, let's say, for, for outsiders of any stripe to actually found a personal vehicle party. It takes years and costs an absolute fortune. And even if you can do that and compete in an election, um, it's probably pointless um, because Indonesia is pretty much unique in enforcing, in not, only, not only having these barriers to party entry, but actually forcing um, political presidential candidates into pre-election coalitions um, with, with established parties. Um, it, it happens in all sorts of other multi-party presidential systems, but Indonesia makes you do it whether you like it or not. So basically, um, I, I, I think that this is really a, a key thing in, in, in preventing the sorts of real radical outsider populist candidacies that we've seen in, in other uh, presidential systems. Um, you can't credibly campaign on a, an anti-party platform in Indonesia, even in a crisis situation, which you know, we didn't even have in 2014, it didn't have in 2019. Um, and what have you seen uh, in Jokowi's presidency? Um, he hasn't governed as a populist. Um, you have seen, you know, the sidelining of his, you know, relawan organizations. There was no attempt to sort of um, keep a personalized supporter base loyal, let alone form it into a party, although many of them would have been very, very happy to have been uh, formed into a party. So I should clarify the relawan. I mean, are these sort of volunteer organizations that um, uh, did a lot of the legwork for Jokowi's campaign in 2014. And instead, you've had actually an embrace of A, political parties, and B, of uh, these intermedi uh, intermediary organizations in the form of things like uh, NU, as, as Nava spoke about earlier. Um, he's made political alliances with them in a way that entrenches NU's role in government as much as it does his, and, and positions NU as this sort of like broker for the support of all these Muslim voters. Now, whether that's real or a perceived effect of that association with Anu, I mean, who knows? But the important thing is, I mean, he is not trying to subvert, you know, the traditional uh, brokers of public support in Indonesia. And when it came to drafting the 2017 electoral law, um, he may have had an opportunity to speak out against the very, very high bars to party building, very, very high bars to contesting a presidential election. He was more concerned with actually maintaining those sort of institutional strictures that he has uh, that he had on him. He came out in defense of the very high presidential threshold, um, probably because he didn't want that many opponents, but also wanted to keep op open the option of the Chapres Tungal, the, the sole presidential candidacy. Everyone forgets about that. Uh, and as for the authoritarian turn, well, um, I think it's clear that it's been done as much in concert with established elites and entrenches their role in government as much as it does his. Um, so I really have to hurry up. Um, now, I know what you're thinking. You're probably saying, okay, what about Prabowo? Well, again, um, perhaps I'm being a little bit too contrarian here, but um, not, not on the question of was Prabowo a populist or a non-populist, but the, I think it's worth uh, asking, was, was Prabowo any more populist in substance than other politicians, than Jokowi or SBE before him? Um, we all associate the, you know, the, the populist rhetoric with, with Prabowo, but like I said, Populist rhetoric is only populist to the extent that it is instrumental to that populist linkage, right? Prabowo began his uh, political career by, of course, founding a personalist party. He bought out these corporatist organ uh, New Order era organizations. His relationship with a big, like, just like Jokowi, again, with a big part of his electoral coalition is intermediated, intermediated by, okay, by the Islamists, anyway. Um, the structural opportunities of populists are still there, um, but the barriers for entry of populists uh, so far, I think, uh, will make it difficult to capitalize on a, a crisis. Um, the, the new electoral law will be really interesting, and he will find out whether I've been talking nonsense this whole time. Um, it may uh, ease the way for populists if you take down those barriers to entry for outsider candidates. Uh, we'll only find out in several years' time. Um, but uh, look, it wouldn't be an Indonesia update if somebody didn't make an extravagantly inaccurate political prediction. So, uh, I mean, let's, let's think about who are the people, who are the kind of figures within the system who, who you're talking about here? Could be an army man, could be a cop, could be a cabinet minister, who knows? <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll defend that one, but uh, yeah, thanks very much.
Thanks, Liam. So next we have from the University of Melbourne, uh, Mugis Mudafir. Good evening, everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Eve and Tom for having me here. Um, maybe a, li a little bit different uh, with the presentation uh, from the uh, from uh, the previous presentation uh, delivered by Liam. Uh, I would like to focus the Islamic populism, especially uh, particularly in Indonesia, and and uh, maybe more focusing on the uh, structural uh, situation or conditions that makes possible the emergence of the uh, Islamic population in Indonesia and its relation with the uh, Indonesia's uh, illiberal democracy. <clears throat> um, uh, in understanding Islamic populism, I would like to uh, quote uh, one of the uh, scholars, uh, Two, actually, Robinson and Hadis in their uh, forthcoming article uh, that varieties of poli po populist politics, including the Islamic one, must be understood in the context of widespread failure of government and elites to deal with larger structural crises that threaten their society and with the disru disruption of old class or patronage based politics by the rise of new cross uh, class alliances. And Based on this understanding, uh, phenomena of Islamic populism in Indonesia have been expressed most dramatically, as we can see uh, during 2017 Jakarta the gubernatorial elections. So, um, and my presentation would like to address three main questions. Uh, the first is, uh, is Islamic populism a symptom or a cause of uh, Indonesia's uh, illiberal democracy? Second question is, uh, is the emergence of Islamic populism an indication of the rising threat of state Islamizations? What is the feature of Islamic populist alliance in Indonesia? I think this is uh, important, uh, at least in my um, view, to understand the feature and the characteristic of Islamic populist alliance so that uh, we would like to uh, also analyze uh, the, how the response, uh, illiberal response undertaken by the uh, current uh, um, Indonesian government. And how does this feature affect Indonesia's democracy? So, and the last question is, why has the government, which is supported by many liberal civil society activists, undertaken a democratic measure in, in addressing the challenges from Islamic populism? What are the consequences of taking illiberal measures in responding to the Islamic populism? So, my presentation will address one by one of these questions. The first question, uh, uh, the uh, the answers to the first question is that I argue that the emergence of Islamic populist politics in Indonesia is a symptom of the dysfunctions of liberal democratic institutions responding to the increasing precariousness among Indonesian Muslims in the context of the absence of the left. So instead of understanding it as the cause of uh, illiberal turn of author or authoritarian turn, uh, uh, Islamic populism um, um, should be understood, I mean, in my view, should be understood more as a symptom of Indonesia's already deeply illiberal politics. So this is because of the illiberal, uh, I mean, nature of Indonesian politics, populist politics emerges. So we can also see the case in many other countries that um, is, uh, Populist politics actually emerged uh, as a result of the uh, failure of the government in delivering uh, social services to the uh, society, while a democratic institution also failed in channeling the interests of the uh, precarious society as well. And uh, uh, and there is no other alternative. Uh, the the political parties also uh, in decline. So so it it provides uh, an opportunity for the, uh, I mean, populist politics emerge in, in that situation. So, Indonesian democracy, uh, in this case, in the sense, uh, I argue that it is already uh, in decline. It is already illiberal. Uh, for, I mean, uh, I mean, 
not be, it, it is this illiberal uh, tendency of Indonesian democracy is not because of the rising Islamic populism, but it is Indonesia's already illiberal democracy that make rise uh, the uh, Islamic populism and and other variety of, of populist politics like nationalist uh, populism. So how to define Indonesia's uh, illiberal democracy? Uh, I will argue that uh, in contrast to, I don't know how to uh, pronounce Boshia, oh, is it Boshia? Yeah. In contrast to Boshia's uh, arguments, uh, Indonesia's uh, illiberal nature of Indonesia's uh, demo Indonesian politics is not a result of the dominations of illiberal ideas in defining national identity and state organizations. But I define the uh, illiberal nature of Indonesian politics is, uh, from the, as a result of the practice of the uh, dominant political economic elites that use, uh, mobilize, uh, I mean, use uh, um, any means, extra, including extra economic means uh, in accumulating uh, power and, and material resources. So, so the accumulation of capital, not only uh, using the production processes, but also using the uh, access of and the uh, state facilities. These that explain the uh, widespread of corruption problem in Indonesia and, 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 I mean, and, and various form of the uh, clientelism in Indonesia. So, and if we uh, look at the, uh, referring to the uh, Fukuyama's uh, definition of the like modern liberal democracy, he said that uh, there are three basic institutions that can define that can be used to define a modern liberal democracy. The first of all, first of all is uh, the state, which is defined as the only entity that can it is defined in Weberian term as the only institution that can monopolize the uh, legitimate use of uh, coercive forces. And in this case, in Indonesia, we can see that uh, the prevalence of uh, gangsters, of uh, vigilante groups, of uh, non-state violent organization remains uh, significant, not only in the uh, societal level, but also in the uh, political mobilization, like what we can see in the case of 2017 uh, Jakarta gubernatorial elections. FBI is one of the uh, vigilante group, violence group that is the main that was the main actors that mobilizes uh, um, um, uh, anti uh, Aho, uh, I mean rallies, and the second factor is uh, the the rule of law. We can see that say, in Indonesia, we there is um, certain we can maybe I, I will argue that um, the law is not um, form and enforced in. Uh, defending uh, the uh, public interest, but most of many of the laws enforce and also uh, form and enforce uh, in the interest of the of the uh, uh, the ruler of the uh, dominant political economic actor instead of uh, instead of the, the 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 public interest. So that's the second factor. And the third factors is uh, democratic uh, accountability, where uh, the government acts in or. Uh, in um, in the interest in favor in, in the interest of the uh, the whole community, but we can see that many public institutions uh, uh, works not in the service of the uh, public interest, but but uh, um, 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 more uh, favoring the interest of the uh, of the uh, powerful elites. So. Considering those uh, three main factors, I can define that uh, um, um, uh, Indonesia's uh, Indonesian's politic naturally uh, has an illiberal. Uh, I mean, Indonesia's politic has illiberal nature, which nurtured during the authoritarian uh, uh, new order, and we can see this. Uh, indication from the prevalence of corruptions, from the various forms of clientelism and predation, as well as the continued survival of non-state violence. And uh, access to and control of public offices remain essential in facilitating and con the concentration of wealth. This is that 
the thing that makes the corruptions is prevalent. And uh, another co coherent force is to try for a more equal uh, distribution of wealth also uh, absent, especially after 1965's uh, um, uh, anti-communist massacres. And within this context, how does the increasing pre precarious society uh, within the neoliberal uh, context channel the, their dissent and hopes. So there is only Islamism and nationalism that provide a reference for, for, for ideological manipulations in this case. So we can see that there is an increasing uh, rise of tendency of the uh, use of populist politics by using Islamic uh, narrative and also nationalist uh, n uh, narrative uh, for the last couple of years. But uh, my answer to my second question is, but Islamic Populist Alliance in Indonesia is characterized as a fragmented and incoherent as seen from many actors, including non-religious leaders that can claim representing the interests of the Ummah. And thus, the increasing mobilization of Islamic sentiment in the electoral contest does not indicate the growing Islamic radicalism or the rising threat of state Islamizations, as argued by many cultural pr perspectives, many scholars using cultural perspective. The mobilization of sectarian sentiment is pervasive in the liberal democratic context as a shortcut to gain popular support. An element of Islamic populism will remain in the political margin because of this uh, uh, feature as fragmented and incoherent. And they will remain subordinated by the, the opportunist, powerful political economic elites that mobilize them using uh, uh, Islamic sentiments. We can see the fragmentation of Islamic, Islamic populism from the multiple and incoherent channels for the Ummah. It can be a channel through violence, like from a uh, through an uh, extremist group, vigilantist group, and also through electoral competition like uh, PKS, uh, PPP, PPP, PAN, and PKP, uh, through social and cultural activities like, uh, I mean, the uh, interests of the Ummah can also be channeled through uh, Muhammadiyah, NU, uh, Majlis Tafsir, Al Quran in Solo, etc., and many other uh, um, social organizations. And multiple actors can also claim representing the interests of the Ummah, including Prabowo. Prabowo Subianto, non-religious politician from Nationalist Party Grinda, has become the leader of Islamic Populist Alliance in the 2019 presidential elections. And also, Sandiaga Uno, uh, his running mate, uh, has also been declared by uh, PKS president, uh, Sohibul Iman, as a uh, post-Islamism uh, Muslim scholar. And we can also see the uh, Hidayat Nur Wahid, deputy chairman of PKS, also declared Sandiaga Uno as, as uh, ulama, as Muslim scholar as well. Daniel, also uh, the leader of Muhammadiyah uh, Vigilante Group, I would say, Kokam, uh, uno as the new Bung Hatta. That's many, I mean, th those uh, kind of justification is to, uh, I mean, that's part of the justification used to establish alliance between the increasing Islamist society and, and, and the, opportunity, the opportunist powerful uh, political economic elites. And we can also see, but the results is, in 2017 uh, Jakarta gubernatorial election, Anis Baswedan, the uh, I mean uh, w the key figure in this uh, Islamic populist alliance, uh, declared that uh, he denies plan to issue Sharia by laws, and also he also denied that he never made any contract with the FBI, one of the main groups that mobilized the uh, anti aho rallies. And the last uh, event that we just saw recently, um, there is a reconciliations 
between Jokowi and Prabowo, and they look really happy. <laughs> Despite uh, the polarization that they already made. And <laughs> this is all, um, I mean, showing that the fragmented Islamis, Islamic populist alliance has been left behind by the opportunist powerful elite. They are nothing, actually. And in the reconciliations, uh, the release of uh, Rizik Sihab, one of their key figures, has not been mentioned in the uh, reconciliation as well. So they just left behind by the, by the uh, I mean, by the, uh, uh, the secular uh, opportunist leaders. So the Islamist elements have become important subject only in the electoral moment. They have never been a key subject in the political negotiation or in the, uh, I mean, uh, in the in the uh, policy making process. And then, considering this condition, why should we worry about Islamic populism? We don't have to be worried about that. So my third argument is: Jokowi's illiberal responses to the Islamic populism is an is an outcome of the limited option available in Indonesia's illiberal politics. It is because Indonesia's, Indonesian, Indonesian politics is already illiberal. It doesn't give much um, option to the current government to respond to the uh, challenges, including from the uh, Islamic populist movement. Such responses embrace a cultural few, few in understanding Islamic populism considered as a symptom of the rising Islamism and the increasing threat of state Islamization, which is, as I already uh, mentioned before, Islamism, should not, we should not be worried about Islamic populism. They will just be being fooled by the uh, politicians. Why should we worry about, about them? So this view is, but. The view, the cultural view, is actually instrumental to conceal the liberal nature of Indonesian politics as a as a cause of the emergence of um, Islamic populism. This can be seen from the reproductions of communist specter, a narrative used to limit the possibilities for the emergence of, for, of uh, alternative political mobilizations. Therefore, embracing cultural view in understanding Islamic populism not only heightens social polarization but also contributes in maintaining a liberal nature of Indonesian politics. We can see the, resp the, the liberal responses from uh, Jokowi's government, from the uh, issuance, from the release of the uh, mass uh, organization regulations, and then anti uh, radicalism campaign, uh, tolerance campaign, etc. It's uh, actually heightened the polarization and also and also worsening the liberal uh, nature of of Indonesian politics. So, including in this picture, this is in Canberra, the supporter of Jokowi. Uh, many of them actually that I know from this picture uh, are um, liberal activists and scholars, and they are supporting Jokowi's uh, illiberal uh, measure, especially in responding to the Islamic uh, populist challenge. They are, they were reproducing anti-communist propaganda. Setia pada NKRI dan tidak terlibat PKI. They said that. They declared that, uh, I mean, campaign material. This narrative produced by illiberal, by liberal activists, but this narrative uh, indeed uh, produce, I mean, maintain and, and justify a liberal measure undertaken by, by Jokowi government. It constrained the space for alternative political mobilizations by producing, reproducing this uh, anti-communist propaganda and concealing the problem of social justice with cultural issue. The problem is seen merely as a religious intolerant instead of like like social injustice, something like that. And, and reproducing anti-communist propaganda also maintains social division along religious lines and, re and reproduce religious identity politics, and in the end, deepening liberalism. So 
The conclusion is, anxiety about rising Islamic radicalism and religious intolerance can, comes out of a view that ignores the origin and the features of Islamic populism. But reinforcing such a cultural view is misleading as it could lead to produce illiberal responses to the fragmented Islamic populism as demonstrated by Jokowi's government. Islamic populism is a mobilizing tool of elites used for the purpose of gaining more material and political power. It is a symptom, not a cause, of Indonesia's already deeply liberal political system. Analyzing Islamic populism and anti-democratic responses to it as a cause of illiberalism is in line with a view that disregards the origin and the features of Islamic Popul populist alliance. Therefore, it also contributes in justifying a liberal measure undertaken by current, Jakarti, uh, current uh, Indonesia's government. Thank you. Okay. So thanks very much to our uh, speakers. We have uh, some time um, left for questions. Uh, obviously, just uh, keep in mind that every question you ask keeps us all from the pub a little bit longer or keeps me from going home to, uh, to the kids. Um, so make them good. Um, so uh, in, in, uh, with that in mind, we have a question uh, over here, and I'll try and group uh, two or three together uh, again as we have. Hi, um, a question for Abdul. Um, you spoke about uh, the definition of democracy where the state has a, mo a monopoly on the legitimate use of force uh, and then referred a little bit to uh, um, uses of force, force by gangsters and, and, and groups like that. I think... I just wanted to hear your thoughts on the distinction around a legitimate use of force and whether you think that those uses of force are legitimate. Uh, in, yeah, thanks. Just up here we have one. Just here. And then also Greg, maybe you go next, Greg. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rafika. I'm from Melbourne Law School. Uh, so I, want to, I would like to ask to Liam. So, uh, from your presentation, it seems that you are focused on the uh, actor-based explanation in explaining populism. So uh, what makes political leader undertaking populist uh, politics and why does it appear just recently in Indonesia? Thank you. Okay. And then last one, Greg, and then we'll go to some answers. Uh, my question was to Mugis, and um, I suppose what troubled me about the paper was you had a succession of really big general statements and not a lot of specific evidence to kind of support them. And just your opening statement about the increasing precariousness of Indonesian Muslims in the context of absence of the left. So if we just began with that statement, where is the evidence of the, this growing precariousness? Are we talking about the Umat Islam very generally? Or are we talking about specific sections of it? Because we have a great deal of evidence about the very rapid expansion of the Muslim middle class, about the growing conservatism within this class. This is an increasingly prosperous class. Um, I could see ways in which your argument could be developed to kind of fit into your broader schema, but I think we need some more data if you're going to convince us of this notion that liberal dis dysfunction in liberal democratic institutions um, is an important explanatory factor in the rise of Islamism. So I'll just leave it there. So, Mugus, we'll go to you first. Thank you. Thank you. For the first question, um, how, do you how do you define legitimate uh, forces in, defining this, in, in identifying what we can define as the state? Uh, so, yeah. That's actually a definition from Weber, uh, who defines the state as the entity that monopolizes the uh, legitimate use of coercive forces as a um, formal coercive institution that can only uh, monopolize legitimate uh, coercive forces in term in the uh, modern uh, state is uh, the uh, military and the police but but the fact is in indonesia we can see that not only those uh, formal uh, coercive institution that can exercise violence legitimately 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 means there is no state punishment 
for those who can exercise violence, like to FBI, to uh, Pemuda Pancasila's member who reads uh, like the uh, bookstore to the uh, discussion, something like that. And, and they coexist with the formal uh, coercive institutions. So they, they gain certain kind of uh, impunity from the states. So in that case, they also legitimately uh, uh, exist in Indonesia, right? And to uh, Greg's uh, question, uh, increasing precarious middle class Muslim. Um, yeah, I should refer to the uh, specific data uh, explaining uh, that trend, but um, in general, uh, the increasing precariousness is not only uh, defined by using economic term that they are, uh, I mean, like um, having uh, um, lower or income. I mean, I mean, defined by using the income data, but also defined by the anxiety that they are, uh, I mean, ex that they experience, like the, um, 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 the security of, of, of their uh, social and economic conditions, although they can be categorized as the, most, as the middle class, but it does not necessarily that they are uh, secure uh, in 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 I mean addressing their not only the not only their future but also their their uh, daily life like like um, maybe in the after reformacy we can see that the increasing there is an increasing trend of the uh, educational level in the uh, Indonesian uh, I should of course I should mention. The, I should provide the data, but I believe that uh, um, mm, I mean the education level in Indonesian society is increasing for a couple of years. But I mean, compared to the uh, maybe 20 years ago uh, generation in the 20 years ago, but their social and economic condition doesn't change much from those who live in 20 years ago. I mean, although their parent, our parent, like my parent, just uh, graduated uh, from, I mean, S1, but, and then the, uh, but many a generation, a recent generation can graduate until a master's study and, and also maybe also a PhD study, but it doesn't mean that they have a better, social situations, including in addressing, in securing their uh, future life. Like, like myself, uh, I don't have saving, something like that. Maybe many of my friends also uh, face the same problem. Although I will just, I will submit my thesis in a couple of days and I will get uh, my PhD, but it doesn't mean that I will I can secure my social, my social and economic, my economic life. I mean, I still have to struggle uh, when I back to my country. That's that's kind of, kind of uh, the thing that explain the precariousness of, of Indonesian Muslim. So, so um, yeah. 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 Um, all right. So the question was about uh, an actor-based understanding of why populism, why populists go populist, as it were. Well, I mean, that's that's what I attempted to, to present, I guess. Um, uh, so that's precisely the point. I mean, the populist politicians are rational actors. They're not just a bunch of yokels. Um, they weigh up the, you know, the, the, the costs and risks of, engage, of governing like a populist. And, you know, in, in, in some Latin American countries, absolutely, the, the path was clear. The, 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 the potential rewards from governing like a populist were far greater than the potential risks. Um, you know, in the Philippines, maybe that's the case. In Indonesia, those political conditions I don't think exist yet. Um, but even if they did, um, the, the, the system is so 
inhospitable in certain in, in important ways to the sort of politician who would choose to who would want to govern like a populist, given the you know given favourable opportunities. That's that's what I hope I uh, I I got across. Okay. Uh, thanks. So we probably have round for uh, time for one more quick round of questions and and um, quick answers. So we've got one in the middle here, and then uh, up, up front here. Sorry. So we'll take these two questions. Uh, John Maxwell, uh, XANU. Um, look, uh, political science jargon, I didn't find myself terribly convinced by the use of populism in either paper. Um, I know Liam did his best to try and help come up with a definition for us, but uh, I wonder if... Uh, he might refer to history and think of the case of former President Sukarno from 1959 onwards. And how does that sit? As far as uh, Abdul uh, Mugis is concerned, I thought if you crossed out populism from his paper and just substituted it with Islamic extremism or Islamic radicalism or, or even Islamist politics, that would have sufficed. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, uh, just to take for a nuanced discussion, I want to put into questions Liam assertions that Jokowi has not contributed to the sad democratic decline. Because if you think about Jokowi propensity to sidestep side uh, bureaucratic means, like the his tendency to produce uh, presidential many presidential decree, including the Hatay ban, or the way he dealt with many economic tender like the high speed railway that is may basically disregard many procedure and the way he put like Hadi as the commander in chief to secure here his alliance, he is the forces that contribute to the set decline. Uh, if I wanna be a little bit more provocative, right? But I also just wonder if uh, on the democratic decline part, whether uh, this is a symptom of a democratic de decline, or maybe this is just him as an actor trying to, uh, you know, work the, f the flaw in the system, I guess. I'm not sure if either of those were questions, actually, but um, <laughs> <laughs> we've got about maybe a minute each just to give uh, a wrap up. Is that right? Uh, I don't think it's, it's a question, it's just a response, right? So just thank you, I will consider that. <laughs> I mean, the question is, is populism a useful category of anything? And yeah, yeah again, like, I, 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 it, it's five o'clock on a Friday. I, I say yes, I say yes, yes, but uh, yeah. I mean, on, 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 on Emir's point, um, I mean, Jokowi, do, ha, do, I mean Jokowi has had a hand in the democratic regression. Um, and all the things you, know, you say are, are you know, evidence of that, and there's plenty, plenty more, as we heard about uh, earlier this morning. Um, the point is that I don't see anything that is instrumental to sidelining political parties, that's to sidelining sort of um, civil society organisations that stand between him and the voters. Um, so, yeah, not a populist authoritarian, maybe just a bit of an authoritarian. And I would say the same thing for Prabowo, but, you know, that's a conversation for the pub. <laughs> So thank you very much to uh, Liam and Mugus. And then also, before you start clapping, uh, a big thanks to Eve and Tom for their fantastic job that they did organizing. <laughs>